Horror Babbles, The Dunwich Horror. Peanuts, George? Aye. Mr. Block? Ah, oh, why not? Larry? Ah, sir. How's about Dunwich, then, Mr. Block? Well, you got me hooked, bartender. Then listen. The following winter saw Wilbur's first trip outside the Dunwich region. It is said that correspondence with the Widener Library at Harvard, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the British Museum, the University of Buenos Aires, and the library of Miskatonic University of Arkham had failed to get him the loan of a book he desperately wanted. So at length he set out in person, shabby, dirty, bearded, and uncouth of dialect, to consult the copy at Miskatonic, which was the nearest to him geographically. Almost eight feet tall and carrying a cheap new suitcase from Osborne's general store, this dark and goatish gargoyle appeared one day in Arkham, in quest of the dreaded volume kept under lock and key at the college library, the hideous Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul el Hazred in Olaus Wormius's Latin version, as printed in Spain in the 17th century. Are you familiar with it, sir? Uh, can't say I am, bartender. Better pay close attention, then. Wilbur had never seen a city before, but had no thought save to find his way to the university grounds where, it is said, he passed heedlessly by the great white-fanged watchdog that barked with unnatural fury and enmity and tugged frantically at its stout chain. Wilbur had with him the priceless but imperfect copy of Dr. D's English version of the Necronomicon, which his grandfather had bequeathed him. And upon receiving access to the Latin copy, he at once began to collate the two texts with the aim of discovering a certain passage which was missing from his own defective volume. This much he could not civilly refrain from telling the librarian, the erudite Henry Armitage, who had once called at the farm back in 1925, and who now politely plied him with questions. He was looking, he had to admit, for a kind of formula or incantation containing the frightful name yag Sathath, and it puzzled him to find discrepancies, duplications, and ambiguities which made the matter of determination far from easy. As he copied the formula he finally chose, Dr. Armitage looked involuntarily over his shoulder at the open pages, the left-hand one of which, in the Latin version, contained such monstrous threats to the peace and sanity of the world. Just picture the scene, the queer stranger and the learned librarian, the former bent over a book of hideous antiquity, the latter mentally translating the words upon its open pages. Nor is it to be thought that man is either the oldest or the last of Earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. Not in the spaces we know, but between them, they walk serene and primal, undimensioned to us unseen. Yogg-Sothoth knows the gate. Yogg-Sothoth is the gate. Yogg-Sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in Yogg-Sothoth. He knows where the old ones broke through of old, and where they shall break through again. He knows where they have trod Earth's fields, and where they still tread them and why no one can behold them as they tread. By their smell can men sometimes know them near, but of their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those they have begotten on mankind. And of those are there many sorts, differing in likeness from man's truest idol on to that shape without sight or substance, which is them. They walk unseen and foul, and lonely places where the words have been spoken and the rites howled through at their seasons. The wind gibbers with their voices, and the earth mutters with their consciousness. They bend the forest and crush the city, 
Yet may not forest or city behold the hand that smites. Kadath in the cold waste hath known them. And what man knows Kadath? The ice desert of the south and the sunken isles of ocean hold stones whereon their seal is engraven. But who hath seen the deep frozen city or the sealed tower long garlanded with seaweed and barnacles? Great Cthulhu is their cousin, yet can he spy them only dimly. Yah, Shabna Gorath, as a foulness shall ye know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet ye see them not, and their habitation is even one with your guarded threshold. Yogsothoth is the key to the gate, whereby the spheres meet. Man rules now, where they ruled once. They shall soon rule, where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter, summer. They wait patient and potent, for here shall they reign again. Dr. Armitage, associating what he was reading with what he'd heard of Dunwich and its brooding presences, and of Wilbur Waitley and his dim, hideous aura that stretched from a dubious birth to a cloud of probable matricide, felt a wave of fright as tangible as a draft of the tomb's cold clamminess. The bent, goatish giant before him seemed like the spawn of another planet or dimension, like something only partly of mankind, and linked to black gulfs of essence and entity that stretch like titan phantasms beyond all spheres of force and matter, space and time. Presently, Wilbur raised his head, and began speaking in that strange, resonant fashion which hinted at sound-producing organs unlike the run of mankind's. George, what was it he said to Armitage? Mr. Armitage, he said, I calculate I've got to take that book home. There are things in it I've got to try under certain conditions that I can't get here, and it would be a mortal sin to let a red tape rule hold me up. Let me take it along, sir, and I'll swear they won't nobody know the difference. <laughs> I don't need to tell you I'll take good care of it. It wasn't me that put this decopy in the shape it is. Armitage, half ready to tell him he might make a copy of what parts he needed, thought suddenly of the possible consequences and checked himself. There was too much responsibility in giving such a being the key to such blasphemous outer spheres. Waitley saw how things stood, and tried to answer lightly. Well, all right, if you feel that way about it. Maybe Harvard won't be so fussy as you be. And with that, Wilbur rose and strode out of the building. Armitage heard the savage yelping of the great watchdog, and studied Waitley's gorilla-like lope as he crossed the bit of campus visible from the window. He thought of the wild tales he had heard and recalled the old Sunday stories in the advertiser. These things, and the lore he had picked up from Dunwich rustics and villagers during his one visit there. Unseen things not of Earth, or at least not of tri-dimensional Earth, rushed fetid and horrible through New England's glens, and brooded obscenely on the mountain tops. Of this he had long felt certain. Now he seemed to sense the close presence of some terrible part of the intruding horror, and to glimpse a hellish advance in the black dominion of the ancient and once passive nightmare. He locked away the Necronomicon with a shudder of disgust, but the room still reeked with an unholy and unidentifiable stench. As a foulness shall ye know them, he quoted. Yes, the odor was the same as that which had sickened him at the Waitley farmhouse less than three years before. He thought of Wilbur, goatish and ominous once again, and laughed mockingly at the village rumors of his parentage. Oh, inbreeding? <laughs> great God, what simpletons. <laughs> Show them Arthur Macken's great God pan, and they'll think it a common Dunwich scandal. <laughs> but what thing, what cursed shapeless influence on or off this three-dimensioned earth was Wilbur Waitley's father. Born on Candlemas, nine months after May Eve of 1912, when the talk about the queer earth noises reached clear to Arkham. What walked on the mountains that May night? 
What rude mass horror fastened itself on the world in half-human flesh and blood? During the ensuing weeks, Dr. Armitage set about to collect all possible data on Wilbur Wakeley and the formless presences around Dunwich. He got in communication with Dr. Houghton of Aylesbury, who had attended old Wakeley in his last illness, and found much to ponder over in the grandfather's last words as quoted by the physician. A visit to Dunwich Village failed to bring out much that was new, but a close survey of the Necronomicon and those parts which Wilbur had sought so avidly seemed to supply new and terrible clues to the nature, methods, and desires of the strange evil so vaguely threatening this planet. Talks with several students of archaic lore in Boston and letters to many others elsewhere gave him a growing amazement which passed slowly through varied degrees of alarm to a state of really acute spiritual fear. As the summer drew on, he felt dimly that something ought to be done about the lurking terrors of the upper Miskatonic Valley and about the monstrous being known to the human world as Wilbur Waitley. Put another log on the fire for me, would you, Larry? Aye. Feeling the chill, Mr. Block? Aye, bartender. Blowing off of those barren hills, sir. Remember what I said about Mother Nature? Can I get you anything else, Joe? Nothing else for me, Len. Sure is a quiet place you've got here, bartender. That's just how we like it, sir. Right, George? Aye. Now then. The Dunwich Horror itself came between Lammas and the Equinox in 1928, and Dr. Armitage was among those who witnessed its monstrous prologue. He had heard, meanwhile, of Whiteley's grotesque trip to Cambridge, and of his frantic efforts to borrow or copy from the Necronomicon at the Widener Library. Those efforts had been in vain, since Armitage had issued warnings of the keenest intensity to all librarians having charge of the dreaded volume. Wilbur had been shockingly nervous at Cambridge, anxious for the book, yet almost equally anxious to get home again, as if he feared the results of being away long. Early in August, a half-expected outcome developed, and in the small hours of the third, Dr. Armitage was awakened suddenly by the wild, fierce cries of the savage watchdog on the college campus, deep and terrible. The snarling, half-mad growls and barks continued, always in mounting volume, but with hideously significant pauses. Then there rang out a scream from a wholly different throat, such a scream as roused half the sleepers of Arkham and haunted their dreams ever afterward, such a scream as could come from no being born of Earth, or wholly of Earth. What's going on here? I don't know. I have no clue. I, I just heard voice. Professor Rice, Dr. Morgan, follow me. What on earth is that frightful stench? Pay it no mind, Warren. I'm staying right here, Henry. My God. What? What is it? Henry, don't get too close to it. The dog has had its way with it, but it, it's, it's still alive. Watch yourself, Henry. What in the world is it, Henry? Can you describe it? I'll try, Frank. It's huge, some nine feet tall. Would it be outrageous to say that it has a look of the Wakeleys about it? It's semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest has the leathery reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back is spotted with yellow and black, and dimly suggests the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, what can I say? Oh. Oh, the skin is thickly covered with coarse black fur, and from the abdomen a score of long greenish-gray tentacles with red-sucking mouths are protruding limply. Oh, their arrangement is odd and seems to follow the symmetries of some cosmic geometry unknown to Earth or the solar system. Christ. On each of the hips, deep-set in a kind of 
The pinkish, ciliated orbit is what seems to be a rudimentary eye, whilst in lieu of a tail there depends a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings, and with many evidences of being an undeveloped mouth or throat. For the love of all things holy. The limbs, save for their black fur, roughly resemble the hind legs of prehistoric Earth's giant saurians, and terminate in ridgy veined pads that are neither hooves nor claws. As it breathes, its tail and tentacles rhythmically change color, as if from some circulatory cause normal to the non-human side of its ancestry. In the tentacles, this is observable as a deepening of the greenish tinge, whilst in the tail it is manifest as a yellowish appearance which alternates with a sickly greyish white in the spaces between the purple rings. Oh, of genuine blood there is none, only the fetid greenish yellow ichor which is trickling along the floor. Wait, it's trying to speak. <laughs> The mumblings of the abhorrent thing trailed off into nothingness. Then came a halt in the gasping, and the dog raised its head in a long, lugubrious howl. A change came over the yellow, goatish face of the prostrate thing, and the great black eyes fell in appallingly. All at once, the dog started up abruptly, gave a frightened bark, and leaped nervously out of the window by which it had entered. Meanwhile, frightful changes were taking place on the floor. One need not describe the kind and rate of shrinkage and disintegration that occurred before the eyes of Dr. Armitage and Professor Rice, but it is permissible to say that Aside from the external appearance of face and hands, the really human element in Wilbur Whateley must have been very small. When the medical examiner came, there was only a sticky, whitish mass on the painted boards, and the monstrous odor had nearly disappeared. Apparently, Whateley had had no skull or bony skeleton, at least in any true or stable sense. He had taken somewhat after his unknown father. Oh, man. Whiskey bartender, if you please. Certainly, sir. Another beer, George? Aye. Yet all this was only the prologue of the actual Dumwich Horror. Formalities were gone through by bewildered officials, abnormal details were duly kept from press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs of the late Wilbur Whateley. They found the countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the domed hills and because of the unwanted stench and the surging lapping sounds which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by Whateley's boarded-up farmhouse. Earl Sawyer, who tended the horse and cattle during Wilbur's absence, had developed a woefully acute case of nerves. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noisome boarded place, and were glad to confine their survey of the deceased's living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. An almost interminable manuscript in strange characters, written in a huge ledger, and adjudged a sort of diary because of the spacing and the variations in ink and penmanship, presented a baffling puzzle to those who found it on the old bureau which served as its owner's desk. After a week of debate, it was sent to Miskatonic University, together with the deceased's collection of strange books for study and possible translation. But even the best linguists soon saw that it was not likely to be unriddled with ease. It was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. The hill noises had been very pronounced during the evening, and dogs barked frantically all night. Early risers on the 10th noticed a peculiar stench in the air. About 7 o'clock, Luther Brown, 
the hired boy at George Corey's, between Cold Spring Glen and the village, rushed frenziedly back from his morning trip to Ten Acre Meadow with the cows. He was almost convulsed with fright as he stumbled into the kitchen, and in the yard outside the no less frightened herd were pawing and lowing pitifully, having followed the boy back in the panic they shared with him. Between gasps, Luther tried to stammer out his tale to Mrs. Corey, describing giant footprints and appalling odors. Mrs. Corey, unable to extract more information, began telephoning the neighbors, thus starting on its rounds the overture of panic that heralded the major terrors. When she got Sally Sawyer, housekeeper at Seth Bishop's, the nearest place to Waitley's, it became her turn to listen instead of transmit. The Sally's boy, Chauncey, who slept poorly, had been up on the hill toward Waitley's and had dashed back in terror after one look at the place and at the pasturage where Mr. Bishop's cows had been left out all night. Old Wakeley's house is all blowed up, Chauncey told Sally, with the timbers scattered round like there'd been dynamite inside. Awful marks in the yard, too. Great round marks. And the whole place is sticky with tar-like stuff that smells awful. Half of Seth's cows are clean gone, and half of them that's left are sucked dry of blood. By that noon, fully three-quarters of the men and boys of Domwich were trooping over the roads and meadows between the new-made Waitley ruins and Cold Spring Glen, examining in horror the vast, monstrous prince, the maimed bishop cattle, the strange, noisome wreck of the farmhouse, and the bruised, matted vegetation of the fields and roadsides. Whatever had burst loose upon the world had assuredly gone down into the great sinister ravine, for all the trees on the banks were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the precipice-hanging underbrush. It was though a house, launched by an avalanche, had slid down through the tangled growths of the almost vertical slope. From below, no sound came, but only a distant, undefinable fetter, and it is not to be wondered at that the men preferred to stay on the edge and argue rather than descend and confront the unknown Cyclopean horror in its lair. Three dogs that were with the party had barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when near the glen. Well, that night everyone went home, and every house and barn was barricaded as stoutly as possible. Needless to say, no cattle were allowed to remain in open pasturage. About two in the morning, a frightful stench and the savage barking of the dogs awakened the household at Elmer Fry's on the eastern edge of Cold Spring Glen, and all agreed that they could hear a sort of muffled swishing or lapping sound from somewhere outside. Mrs. Fry proposed telephoning the neighbors, and Elmer was about to agree and the noise of splintering wood burst in upon their deliberations. It came, apparently, from the barn, and was quickly followed by a hideous screaming and stamping amongst the cattle. The dogs slavered and crouched close to the feet of their fear-numbed family. Fry lit a lantern through force of habit, but knew that it would be death to go out into that black farmyard. Uh, going to wait out the storm, Joe? I, I'll have a brandy. Coming right up. The next day, all the countryside was in a panic. Two titan swaths of destruction stretched from the glen to the Fry farmyard. Monstrous prints covered the bare patches of ground, and one side of the old red barn had completely caved in. Of the cattle... Only a quarter could be found and identified. Some of these were in curious fragments, and all that survived had to be shot. Earl Sawyer suggested that help be asked from Aylesbury or Arkham, but others maintained it would be of no use. Darkness fell upon a stricken countryside too passive to organize for real defense. In a few cases, closely related families would band together and watching the gloom under one roof, but in general there was only a repetition of the barricading of the night before, and a futile, ineffective gesture of loading muskets and 
setting pitchforks handily about. Nothing, however, occurred except some hill noises. And when the day came, there were many who hoped that the new horror had gone as swiftly as it had come. When night came again, the barricading was repeated, though there was less huddling together of families. In the morning, both the Fry and the Seth Bishop households reported excitement among the dogs and vague sounds and stenches from afar, while early explorers noted with horror a fresh set of the monstrous tracks in the road skirting Sentinel Hill. As before, the sides of the road showed a bruising indicative of the blasphemously stupendous bulk of the horror. Whilst the confirmation of the track seemed to argue a passage in two directions, as if the moving mountain had come from Cold Spring Glen and returned to it along the same path. At the base of the hill, a thirty-foot swath of crushed rubbery saplings led steeply upward, and the seekers gasped when they saw that even the most perpendicular places did not deflect the inexorable trail. Whatever the horror was, it could scale a sheer stony cliff of almost complete verticality. And as the investigators climbed around to the hill's summit by safer routes, they saw that the trail ended, or rather reversed, there. It was there that the Waitleys used to build their hellish fires and chant their hellish rituals by the table-like stone on Maeve and Hallow Mass. Now that very stone formed the center of a vast space thrashed around by the mountainous horror, whilst upon its slightly concave surface was a thick and fetid deposit of the same tarry stickiness observed on the floor of the ruined Wakeley farmhouse when the horror escaped. Men looked at one another and muttered. Then they looked down the hill. Apparently, the horror had descended by a route much the same as that of its ascent. To speculate was futile. Reason, logic, and normal ideas of motivation stood confounded. Thursday night began much like the others, but it ended less happily. The whippoorwills in the glen had screamed with such unusual persistence that many could not sleep, and about 3 a.m. all the party telephones rang tremulously. Those who took down their receivers heard a fright-mad voice shriek out, Help! Oh my God! Some thought a crashing sound followed the breaking off of the exclamation. There was nothing more. No one dared do anything. And no one knew till morning whence the call came. Then those who had heard it called everyone on the line and found that only the Fries did not reply. The truth appeared an hour later when a hastily assembled group of armed men trudged out to the fry place at the head of the glen. It was horrible, yet hardly a surprise. There were more swaths and monstrous prints, but there was no longer any house. It had caved in like an eggshell, and amongst the ruins nothing living or dead could be discovered. Only a stench and a tarry stickiness. The Elmer Fry's had been erased from Dumwich. Might I propose another round of drinks at this interval, gentlemen? Aye. Aye. Whoa! If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, 
See the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.